Well, I'm the administrator of the Louisville Historical Museum, and our program today is about signs in downtown Louisville. Um, I have put out some copies of the Louisville Historian that have this as, its, as the topic of the lead article, and you're welcome to take them. I also put out some membership forms. So just as a reminder, people who become our members or members of the Louisville His History Foundation, they get this in the mail four times a year. And our last topic was signs. And I want to talk a little bit about how I started thinking about signs and why I thought of this topic. My first inspiration was a person who lives in Louisville who is a sign painter who has painted so many signs downtown. And I hope that when this program is over, you'll have more of an awareness of what he has done for downtown Louisville. Um, he, He's shown there in his workshop just last week, he's working on the alley signs. And he, many years ago, painted the, um, the sign on the, uh, the front of the Louisville Historical Museum. And so Ed Helmstead, the way he um, indicates that he's done a sign is through this um, little thing down in the corner. He writes, Ed did it, and he puts the date. And now, as I go around on Main Street and Front Street, I am noticing so many signs. And actually, I asked him last week, how many signs do you think say Ed did it in downtown Louisville? And he said about 20. So that just shows you. And some of his signs are gone from businesses that have moved out also. So he has really made an impact. And I'll be giving a program with him on September 21st where, where I'll interview him that evening in this room. And so if you're interested in this topic, come, or if you want to meet Ed, come and bring your questions for him. So another inspiration I had was working at the historical museum and seeing old pictures of buildings I was noticing different signs from different eras and how signs have changed. And this topic, to me, is really the confluence of, when you think about it, art and design, design history, because signs are now made out of different things and with different materials than they used to be, sort of marketing history, now that we know a lot more about how to market a business, um, the history of buildings in Louisville, um, the impact of one individual like Ed. Um, there are so many things, and I guess just commerce and business in general, because these signs are being used to promote businesses. It's all these things coming together, and I think this, this makes it a really interesting topic. So here's the State Mercantile Building, very recognizable landmark, iconic landmark. For a long time, it was actually called Carveth Brothers and Dalby, same building, you can see it's from the same view. Isn't that neat? Um, it was actually first the State Mercantile Company, then for several decades, Carveth Brothers and Dalby, and it was the Dalby store. Then down at the bottom there, you can see from when it was Steinbaugh's, uh, the hardware store that was there from the 70s to the 90s. I'm sorry that picture doesn't go all the way across, but uh, that's, that's what the photo looked like that I had available. And that's what it looks like today. So here you have one building, and kind of the history of all those businesses are told through these photographs. Then I had another inspiration. Um, this is a photo I took of Main Street in 2006. So 10 years ago, I was out and about. I decided to take some pictures. And I came upon it recently and realized that there are four businesses on here that have completely changed and now have different signs. So one of them, you'll see this here, this looks pretty much the same, the State Mercantile, and here's Vicks. But here's the Druid Arms, where the Waterloo is now. Do some of you remember the Druid Arms? Then here's Senor T's, Mexican restaurant where Madeira Grill is now. Across the street, here's Pasquini's, where the Empire is now, and now has the Empire sign. And you can kind of see right here is Tullian's, where Zucca is now. So that also really got me thinking about um, businesses changing, signs changing. Let me go on to the next one here. 
Well, that doesn't want to let me out. There we go. So I'm going to start by looking back at some early pictures, and we'll look at some really early signs. But I'm not approaching this completely chronologically, because I decided to then focus on individual buildings and show the chronology within each building. So um, another thing I want to point out is that we're going to see some signs for Coke and 7-Up. <laughs> and it really made me aware of how many more signs like that there used to be. So you may see those crop up in some of these images. So here's early 1880s in Louisville. There might be some signs. I'm kind of thinking there might be some signs here. They're kind of hard to read. Here's another picture from around the same time. Here are a few signs. Just paint on the front of the building. Says maybe, maybe the person's name who runs the business and what they sell. So that says general merchandise there. And by the way, this is Spruce Street looking west. And here are the mountains. And there's the old grade school at what is now Memory Square Park. Here are saloons on Front Street. And other than some, uh, a sign on the windows here, there's, you don't really see very much. This does say Budweiser, very important. <laughs> Here's a business on Main Street. and. Um, we know that this is Charles Clark who operated this little store. His sign is actually, it seems to be kind of a sandwich board that says C.A. Clark, Justice of the Peace, real estate, collection agent, all these things. I kind of thought there'd be a big sign across the top, but in a small town, you kind of knew where everyone was. You probably didn't need that much signage. Yeah, so this photo is actually from the Carnegie Library. So it has a watermark on it. And that's why. Yeah. Good question. The question was, is there a sign up here? And that is a, it's a watermark from the Carnegie Library. Here, I love this picture. This is um, Dr. Wolfer and Flora Wolfer in front of their house and the post office. So the post office is this building on the right. And he was the postmaster. And this is now where the Chamber of Commerce is, by the way. And there is no sign indicating that that's the post office. I just love that you, know, you kind of knew where to go get your mail. You didn't need a, the Louisville citizens didn't need a sign to tell them that. And then this is also from the Carnegie Library. Um, and that's why there's a watermark here. So this is Louisville from, I think it's probably taken from a train because of how high up it is on the tracks. And um, this is the school that I was referring to earlier that's at what is now Memory Square Park. And this says Bon Ton Restaurant. And I love that it's facing the tracks. You know, this was meant to get people who were on the train to get off and eat in that restaurant. And that's the only picture we have of this. And I don't know who ran the restaurant. Love to know more about it. And here are some pictures coming next that show just really basic signage, you know, telephone exchange. Uh, general merchandise on Main Street. This is now the lawyer's office. Um, I think it's 813 Main. This is Andy Oates and his Sportsman's Palace that was a saloon on Front Street. And something I love about this is they made it kind of look like there's a ribbon behind his name. And that's probably the fanciest thing on these old signs in downtown Louisville that I've seen. So um, Joe DeFrancia started what we now know as 740 Front, that was the old Louisville Inn. And before that, it was DeFrancia's Saloon. He also started this saloon that's in the 700 block of Front Street um, on the east side. And it's gone now. But I love this sign, his sign on the front that has his name going one way and um, then Union Beer Hall going this way. and. Uh, 
there are a lot of little touches that, you know, it, it was really a very nice building. And I think some of you may even remember this one. It wasn't looking so good in like the, the 60s, I would say, from pictures that I've seen. The Crystal Palace, another saloon. We're not quite sure where this one was on Front Street, but um, again, just painted, you know, dark paint on a white background. And of course, with these black and white photos, we don't know if some of these signs were in color. When we get to more current photos, you'll see how colorful the signs are now, as you can tell just from walking around in downtown Louisville. But of course, black and white photos, we can't really tell. Here's the Louisville News, and this was located where the patio for the Huckleberry is now. <laughs> yes, in the back. So it's facing Pine, and oops, and this is where Henry's is now. So there was this newspaper building, and later it was where the Louisville Times was printed, and the editor of the Louisville Times actually lived in a little room on the side here. Another sign that's, um, this is where the Blue Parrot parking lot is now, um, and very basic sign. I'm showing lots of examples of, you know, just painted signs. Um, this is white on a darker background, and of course this is the grain elevator on County Road, and um, I believe that the sign is going to be put back on it, or at least that's the plan. So that will be really, really fun to see. This is so basic. Here it says Barker's Bar, and this says Guy's and Henry's Place. <laughs> Not, not a lot of marketing effort going into this, but that's all you needed. You didn't need more than that, you know. This is a little different because this is painted right on glass, and this, was, this would have been after Prohibition started when some saloons were converted to pool halls because they couldn't sell alcohol anymore, um, or at least not legally sell alcohol anymore. But um, I love the kind of fancy, they could maybe get a little more detail with painting on glass than, than on a really big surface, um, just black on white or something like that. And my point in showing this picture is that even in 1948, the, the lettering was pretty, pretty basic. And this is a shoe shop that's now where the marketplace building is. Do some of you remember that one? Yeah. So the marketplace building kind of goes across the front of this, and this house where the Pelillo family lived has been incorporated into the marketplace building, and you can see it from the side. It's actually just right over here. So when you go behind the marketplace, you're actually looking at the back of this house, which is really neat. So I want to kind of set the stage that in the 1940s, and again, this photo is from the Carnegie Library. I want to give credit to them, and that's why there's a watermark on it. So here's Main Street in the 40s. Um, some signs, you can see L.J. Massoni here. There's a Coca-Cola sign here on a drugstore. Um, yeah, the bungalow drugstore. It's, it's, it would be where... Um, the, the parking lot next to City Hall is now, and here's the Austin Niehoff House that's now the Parks and Rec Department. And here's a picture from 1954, also from the Carnegie Library. And so the signs have gotten more sophisticated. It looks like there's some neon. Uh, the Rex Theater has a marquee here. Um, but I want to point out a business that came along in the 50s that did, it changed so much about um, logos and branding, and it was really done by someone who did not have a training in this, and it was Kolaches. So this sign has become kind of an iconic sign, and um, here it is in the 90s when it's all lit up, and I want to read something. Let me find it here. how Anthony Kalachi came up with this design. 
So he designed the sign and he started the restaurant in the 50s. Almost every aspect of it represented something personal to him. So the sign is supported by a large number seven, which was his lucky number. The beacon that had a lighthouse style light on the top, and you can see that right here. It was there for a relative who was in the military. The, dot, the star for the dot above the I represented his mother. The apostrophe represented his father, and the S represented himself in the word kolaches. And so this, to me, this is amazing, the, the cursive red, how stylized it is. And they started using this look in all their materials for a long time. And that's really different from what we see in a lot of the other, um, a lot of the other signs. So here is Kalachi still on the, on the left there, and on the right, an ashtray from Kalachi's where it still has that stylized Kalachi sign. Um, really neat that he did this without having a background in design. Um, and it worked. You know, people came to eat at Kalachi's, and I'm, I'm going to show the Blue Parrot and their sign also. Um, both of those restaurants drew so many people to Louisville and really put Louisville on the map from like the the 50s to the 70s, would you say? Those of you who grew up here around that era. Um, this is a menu cover from Kalachi's, and look, there's the beacon. It says, look for the beacon at the top there. Look for the beacon is on this sign, this ad. Um, and even the trucks around 1990 had this really stylized, the, the way they wrote the name. I just think it's really neat. And so the sign was changed to Pasquini's. A lot of you may remember that. And now it's the Empire. And I realized when I took that picture of the Empire and then I was putting the slideshow together that I was standing in exactly the same place as the, Pasqu the person who took the picture for the Pasquini sign. Isn't that fun? All right, now I'm going to talk about the Blue Parrot and how its signs changed. So it actually started as a drugstore. It was the Huber Drugstore, and that was in around 1915 that this picture was taken. In 1948, the building had been quite changed, but I think that this, this little building was still, um, still under there, but it had been added on to, expanded. It was getting to be a very popular place. So in the 60s, it looked like this. In 78, it looked like this. So here's their sign. And you know these black and white pictures truly do not do justice to how colorful this sign is. It is a beautiful sign. And with the image of the blue parrot, that was another, you know, they were among the first also to do that, to really have something, a logo that was really recognizable to promote their business. And isn't that beautiful? So now I'm going to talk. Were there questions before I go on? We, we don't remember the Joe Colacci sign. We look at it every day and we never really I know. It. You know what? I had to actually go check. And I just took this, um, this bottom picture last week. And I thought, does it say Joe Colacci's? And it does. It's, it does. Yeah. I had to go check to make sure because I had exactly the same question in my head. Sometimes it takes seeing something in a setting like this to then um, notice it when you're out and about. Bridget, can you tell up on the one from the 1960s? It says it. It does on the 70s. It does not look like it says it. So the question is, does the blue parrot sign say Joe Colacci's on this sign from the 60s? It looks like it does not and that it does here. <laughs> so, so we figured it out that it was Mike Kalachi who had the restaurant in the 60s. And so when Joe Kalachi took it over, that must have been when it was added. And I didn't even mention how we now have this beautiful mural um, on the side of the building that really adds a lot also. I think I have heard that. The question is, was the sign one of the, thing, one of the only things saved from the fire that um, 
the building burned in the 80s. And I think I have heard that, although yeah, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Hmm. So now I want to get into what's been at the corner of Pine and Main, the uh, northwest corner that's now where Lulu's and La Revolution are. So it was the Miners Trading Company, this beautiful big brick building says, you know, very basic lettering, the Miners Trading Company across the top. Um, and again, these photos are also from the Carnegie Library, and I was so excited when I realized the Carnegie had them. And the reason they were taken is not for, it's kind of a sad reason. Um, there was subsidence, and the ground dropped several inches in this area, and big brick buildings like that just can't take it structurally. And so it had to be condemned, and it was demolished. And the purpose of these photos, it's a whole series of photos taken from every side of the building, it was to document the cracks in the, in the walls. So if you were to look closely, you would see that there are cracks um, that, that made it so that the building couldn't, um, couldn't continue to stand. But I never knew that there was a majestic theater. Like, it was from this pict these pictures that I was like, what, a theater in that building? I had never heard of that before. So there are all these things that we are finding out about Louisville history from old signs. This actually says Billy's Palace, and it's a restaurant. Um, again, we don't know very much about it. So here's another view of that corner when it was Rocky Mountain Stores. It was a different business, and this building had actually been moved in. A big two-story building like that was moved in to take the place of the old brick building. Then it became Tony and Jim's service station. Some of you probably remember that. And this evolved then into another service station, but I think keeping some of, I think some of this um, is the same, and we'll just kind of look at this. I remember when it looked like this. Well, I think it was a Phillips 66. The question was, uh, what kind of station was it? It was Phillips 66. I don't think it had a personal name associated with it. And this is what it looks like now. And of course, we have this wonderful, these wonderful signs that are um, completely unique. Mark where you are. You know, you're at this restaurant, you're at Lulu's. And I would guess that in a location like this, where two restaurants are sharing space, it's especially important to have that, those unique um, images. Now we're going to be talking about what is now Casa Alegre. So it was Joseph Lackner's um, saloon or tavern a long time ago. He, he has his name across the front here. Of course, there's a sign for the beer, the kind of beer he sells. I'm really intrigued that it has, it looks like it has an L apostrophe. I don't know why that is, because he was of Austrian or German descent, but um, maybe it was the sign painter that took a little license with the sign. I don't know. Then we see here, it says, it, the, the sign, the picture is kind of cut off, but it was the track in, and it actually says Frenchie's track in, because someone with the nickname of Frenchie was running it at the time. And there's a 7-Up sign, like the ones I've been noticing going through these old pictures. 7-Up and Coke were, were seen a lot more than they are now, I think. This actually says Track In on it. And I'm really fascinated that it says Smorgasbord every Sunday, something I didn't know about Louisville or that building. Here's, um, again, the Track In sign. Then we get into when it was called the Pine Street Junction. So it looks like it's the same, the same sign location, like the, it's mounted the same way, but now it says Pine Street Junction. And Casa Alegre now. And here the sign is in the same place here, but they have a lot of other signs too. And just in general, I think walking around downtown Louisville, we see a lot more signs than we used to see. Were there any questions or comments before I go on? 
Okay, so there was a comment about the train depot that was located very close to here, to where Casa Alegre is. It was just to the south along the tracks. So the train depot that was there was moved in the 60s to uh, Pine and Lafarge, and it's now the Louisville Preschool. And it would have had a sign indicating that it was a depot, and that sign isn't on it anymore, but it's fun to look at that. So now we get to the Rex Theater. Um, the Rex has had a really interesting history in terms of its signs. So um, here it's a hand-painted sign, says Rex Theater, and this is some kind of pressed tin behind it. And then you can see that the pressed tin is still there, but the, the Rex sign itself looks a little different. And a marquee has been added, and this says Rex right above it. This picture um, on the upper left here is from 1948, and then this one is from around 1957. So they have changed the top here. They've covered it, but the marquee is still there. Then it became Senor T's Mexican Restaurant. That was from the 70s until about 2008. Then um, it was the Alley Cat for a short time. I want to say maybe 2009, 2010. And um, I happened to be walking by when they were uncovering. The, so this is what had been on it when it was Senior T's. This press tin was still underneath there. And um, I was really happy to get a picture of this sign, too. Then it became the Rex again. It says Louisville Rex, a marquee on there. It says Rex up here. And then again, I happened to be walking by when they were actually changing the sign to say Madeira Grill. And I was really excited. These are the things I get excited about. Uh, catching people in the act of changing business names uh, and being able to document that and when it happened. And now it's the Madeira Grill. So now I'm going to get into another, the signs for a different building. And I'm wondering if you all recognize what this is, because there's not really a sign on it. Yeah, so the, the Eberharder House was here on the left, and that's what's now the Chamber of Commerce. And this was a store run by Martha Eberharder. I'm aware that it was a plumbing shop at one time, too, but I think... And, and before Martha Eberharder had it, it was Dr. Wolfer's, um, uh, his medical office. And I took this 10 years ago when it was the Tiger Herb Company. I don't know if you remember that. And um, most recently, it's been Via Deluxe. And yeah, I understand that is closing, unfortunately. So it'll be interesting to see what sign will go up there next. Now I want to get into the history of this interesting building. The Hacienda was built. It was not built like in the early 1900s. There was actually a fire in this area in the late 20s, so it came after that in the 30s or 40s. It was the Hacienda restaurant. It was also known as Panetta's for a while. So here in 1978, it's Luigi's. And there's a sign for spaghetti on it. And um, Luigi, I believe, was connected with the, his, he was a Colabello, so he was con connected with, the, connected with the Kalachi family. So mem different members or different members of the extended Kalachi family had different restaurants in town, even as many as four that I can think of. Um, Here's Tullian's again. I don't have a good picture from, from the front, but um, a lot of us remember when that was Tullian's. And now, of course, this is Zucca. So you just see signs made out of different materials now. They usually show some kind of logo, or it's a very stylized kind of writing. And I bet when you guys go out and are walking around downtown Louisville, or really anywhere, I, I've started to become so much more aware of this topic, just uh, commercial signs and what they communicate about the business. 
So now I want to get into this building. Uh, the melting pot building was Barr's grocery store. So it was just this uh, false front square store that says Barr's on the front of it here and up here. Some Coca-Cola signs. And that store represents, or I should say this part of the melting pot building represents the original store. And then this was added on. And of course, the tipple being brought from New Mexico, because the first restaurant that was there in the 80s had a, a mine, mining theme. It was the Black Diamond restaurant. And um, here's a close up of the melting pot sign. Again, all different kinds of materials we see now. And um, really, really, so much creativity has gone into all these signs. So the question is, which Vara had the grocery store here? So um, I'll throw that out to the audience. So Albert and Elizabeth Vara. So the answer from the audience is that Albert and Elizabeth Vara had this grocery store and then moved it to where the Huckleberry is now. And then Elizabeth had a flower shop at the Huckleberry. We don't have a picture of a sign from that flower shop, and I wish we had that. I'll be showing pictures of that building in just a minute. So here's a building that a lot of us will recognize. Um, it's now Moxie. So in 1948, um, well, it started as a residence. It was then a doctor's office for several years. Um, at this time in 1948, it may have been still a doctor's office or had, had gone to a residence by that time. But I love that there, there are signs here that say how many miles to Denver and to Boulder. It's really, really neat that, to, to see that. And 10 years ago, um, it was Grand Finale Pastry Shop. So when I see these signs when, where I remember the business that was in there, and I don't know about you, but it just brings back so many memories. Just seeing that sign, it's like, oh, I remember that, and I remember what we used to go and buy there. It's really a neat way to kind of remember different places in Louisville. Then it became the porch. And it's interesting how there's a whole color theme. A lot of businesses now have, you know, they use certain colors in their signage, obviously. And here's the Moxie sign using a piece of wood. And um, I want to get back to Ed Helmstead. This is one of the signs that he made. And um, there's a close-up of it and a close-up of Ed did it. I just know that you guys are going to all go and start noticing all these just like I have. It's really fun, really, really fun. And it's just amazing to me, uh, you know, Louisville just keeps surprising me, that we have a sign painter. <laughs> and this is kind of a dying art, but Louisville has a sign painter that lives here and does all these signs. It is truly incredible. He has left his mark on so many aspects of downtown. Here's the Joe's Market building. Um, so starting in 78, here's um, Joe D'Amato and his wife Rose in, in front of Joe's Fruit Store. Pretty basic lettering, Joe's Fruit Store, Italian and domestic groceries. It then was Joe's Market, and this was in the 80s. Um, I was trying to remember, I think it was around 2000 that it became a uh, a different kind of market, more like a deli, and they sold sandwiches. Some of you may remember that. So now I want to get into the building next to it, and then I'll show both of them what they both look like now. This was the Bug Dust Pool Hall with a sign that says Bug Dust. So that would mainly have meaning probably for people in town who knew that that was uh, John Madonna's nickname, and that's why it was called the Bug Dust Pool Hall. It was the Louisville Times building for a while, and that was in the 80s. And now this is what those buildings look like. So lots more signs on them. This is by Chance, the gift shop on this side. And this says Mudslingers. And this is Creative Framing. Um, Ed actually has worked on all three of these signs, too. But look how, how kind of basic these are by comparison. I mean, I know they're not in color, but 
um, you know, you worked with the materials you had at the time, and um, now there's just so much more possible with, with commercial signs. This used to be in season. Um, this, I believe, is another of Ed's signs. And this was on this building that's now um, Bella Frida. Very, very colorful sign there. And this is Caddy Corner from the museum. This is when it was the Chili Hut. Some of you remember that? And just seeing that sign, I remember the Chili Hut. I remember being inside it. Then it was um, Creations Gallery. And now it is Cooper's Corner. It makes me think about how business owners going in or someone renting a building to have a business or to start a business, it must be kind of challenging to figure out where am I going to put my sign, how am I going to increase foot traffic, um, interesting, interesting issues faced by business owners. I want to get into the signs showing on what's now 740 Front, the restaurant on Front Street. So that started as De Francia's Saloon, as I mentioned before. Um, we don't have a good straight on view of the front of the building, um, but we have the side, this image showing the side of the, the building when it was E.J. De Francia, agent for Tivoli Beer. Um, then it became, um, I'm trying to see what it was at this time. I know that it was the Colorado Cafe. It went, had different names at different times. That was in 1948. Then it became the Old Louisville Inn. And this was back when it served Mexican food. And that was from around the 70s to the 90s, that it was, it was called the Old Louisville Inn, but it was run by Hugh McKenzie serving Mexican food. Then it became the Old Louisville Inn, more like in recent memory as we've known it. So I think it's kind of interesting that here's the sign for the Old Louisville Inn, and here's the color scheme of the building. And then the, the paint colors of the building changed, but this sign is the same. It just kind of shows how business owners can make a change without changing the basic sign. I think that's really interesting. And here's 740 Front now. Um, it's, it's interesting that they have this as kind of their logo that's also seen inside the restaurant. And um, this has been repainted. And look down here, there's Ed did it. <laughs> and the date. Um, the question is whether it was an inn. I don't think so. It was not really an inn where people stayed. It, it was. Mm-hmm. So you're remembering how it was the Primrose Cafe, I think it was called, and it was the Colorado Cafe before that, and I think Front Street Cafe. Mm -hmm. So I think in may have been used to refer to you know, an eating and drinking establishment more than a, a place to sleep. So now we're getting into what's now the Double Happy Building. So, and here's a Coke sign again. Um, in these old photos, it's amazing how often these Coca-Cola signs appear. So this was a drugstore, and it was just this corner part of what's now a building that goes farther across. And in the 30s, you can see here that it has been made to go all the way across, and you can see how this is still this building. Does that make sense? Um, and it was the manga store, so they put their... The Mangus family owned the whole building with two businesses on each side, and they wanted to show their name on the, on the top of it there. Um, and of course, this helps a lot in doing research that we know that the Manguses owned it at the time that photo was taken. It, it's really helpful when people's names are on the buildings. Then it became a furniture store, but it still has the basic shape as this. And this is in 1948. Then it, um, you can see it had the siding put on, and there were a couple other rest. Uh, there was a Johnny's restaurant on this side, and I think this says Baker and Associates, and I'm not sure what business that was. 
Then around 1980, I think it became a restaurant, the whole thing. And this is what it looks like now. Uh, the Double Happy Restaurant here at, um, on Main Street. Uh, here's a sign for Double Happy Chinese Restaurant. And there, if you look closely, there it says Ed did it. Yes. So the audience is remembering that a sporting goods store called Crempley's was in there in around the 40s. I, I wish we had a picture of what that sign looked like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they lived in the back of the store, and that was actually that's another big difference between kind of then and now. Business owners would live right on the premises, and we don't see that really anymore. Um, so this is, here's the singing cook, what's now the singing cook and the bookseller. And in 1948, um, the, this was the Twin Light Tavern at the time, and next to it was a barber shop. Yeah, Woody's. We're, I'm, I'm glad that people are remembering the names. And then in the 70s, uh, it was different businesses in there. Um, you can see some of the, there are certain symbols that are really similar as what they used to be, and this, this has continued. Um, but now, of course, this says Singing Cook, and this is the bookseller, and here's the kind of the logo for the bookseller, which it, it's, um, very creative because it just with a few strokes it really communicates what that business is about. Any questions about this one before I go on? Bob Woody had that little barber shop and then um, Boston mm -hmm. took it over when Bob retired. So the, the barber shop was um, Bob Woody's and then Herm Fossens, yes. Mm -hmm. Domenico's owns the Twin Light, yeah. And this is a little building next to Thunderbird Barbers. So it's 906 Main, and here it is in the 70s, and it was a liquor store at that time. And I really like this sign. This is one of my favorites, Polly's. A lot of us will remember Polly's Italian Ice and Gelato. Um, and this was a sign that Ed Helmstead made also. Um, so here it is. This is when it was Polly's, and this is the sign. And now it's Nina's, and Ed also created this sign. And there's the Ed did it. So I'm really prepping all of you for when we have this program in three weeks, and you'll all get to meet Ed and ask him questions and how he got to be a sign painter and... Um, what was the first sign he ever wrote Ed did it on? I'd like to ask him that. Um, now the Huckleberry Building. So in the early 1900s, it looked like this. It was a bank, and it also became the post office. In 1978, it was, and it was different things in between, I should mention, but uh, like the flower shop run by Elizabeth Vara that we were remembering. Here's Karen's Kitchen with a sign here, and it says Country Kitchen there. Then it looks like later she changed it to say Karen's Country Kitchen right on the she side there. The building next door mm -hmm. and made it all one. So people are remembering that um, this was a beauty shop at one time before it became part of this restaurant. And um, actually, I just recently learned that Old Style Sausage, run by the Dvorsky family, started on the left side of this building, something else I had never known before. That people in our audience are nodding their heads. So here's the Huckleberry sign now um, on wood. Uh, Ed Helmstead did this, and I believe it says Ed did it right there. Um, 
And of course, there's a whole theme with the color and the idea of huckleberries. So much more advanced than how it used to be with just painting your name on the front of a building, if that. As we saw, some people didn't do that. Uh, now I want to get into what's now the Waterloo. So it was um, Celeste, am I saying that right? Celeste, Celeste Romano's. And it was kind of a, a bar where kids could also go and buy ice cream, from what I remember, from what I remember people telling me. Um, that in 1940, so in 1948, it looked like this. So by the 70s, it had become Pasquale's. Mm -hmm. And I think Pasquale this. Pasquale was the brother of Luciano Colabello. Mm -hmm. So he was involved in the Colossi family. Thanks for bringing that up. So Pasquale Colabello was also related to the extended Colacci family. And he had one of these four Colacci related restaurants in town. So it was Pasquale's. Then, as I was saying before, it was the Druid Arms Pub. And that was in 2006. And now it's the Waterloo. So you can really tell it's the same building. But it's fascinating how the look changes just from changing the colors and the sign. Um, I think it's just fascinating. And of course, you can always tell what this building is because it's between two buildings that have such a unique look, the State Mercantile Building and then what's, what was that um, Stoiber's General Merchandise Store and it's now the lawyer's office here. And Masoni's also. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting close to the end here, but I wanted to focus on the huge changes that have taken place at this location. So this was opened as um, City Market in the 1960s. And I think, it's really hard to tell, I think that sign across the top says Grand Opening, and it doesn't, I'm not actually seeing where it says City Market on here. Do you have photos of the feed store that was mm -hmm. there on the alley before? Yeah. So there was a. There was a question about whether we have photos at the museum of the feed store that was located here. So there was a, a house. There was a, I think first there was a house in this location. Then there would have been a service station called Hockaday's that was at an angle here. And then a feed store was put in, uh, run by the Thomas family. Then those buildings were torn down to create this building in the 60s, which was the city market. And then. On the, in the last 15 minutes of the last day that the post office was open, I ran over there and took some pictures of it. I remember I was sitting at my desk at the museum, and I was like, oh, it's about to close. I have to go over there and get pictures. And I did get pictures of the interior, the exterior. But this was, these were the last, the last 15 minutes of it being open as a post office. And I have a couple of pictures here. It was. Um, you know, winter time, so the sun was setting, and you, I got this neat light. Um, look at that huge parking lot. And look at it now with Lucky Pie and Sweet Cow being there. So, I'm sorry? It's the same, it's the same building. building. Yes, yeah, same building as the city market and then the post office. And of course, you wouldn't expect, let me just go back to this one, you wouldn't expect a post office building to have a lot of fancy signage. You know, it's a government building. So that, of course, was very basic. But it's really interesting when you go over there, the, the logos and the color scheme, very recognizable. Here, Lucky Pie is on their little oven there. Here's a sign about parking that has both logos here. And here, of course, is the Sweet Cow sign. And I wanted to acknowledge that we don't really have that many businesses that are national businesses. But I did take pictures of a few signs, Chase, Chicago Title, and Edward Jones. I think I'm right that these are all, these are not local businesses. These are nationally known businesses. And we do have some of them in town. And if, you know, they, they, their signs are very, very recognizable because we don't see them only in downtown Louisville. 
And I wanted to just add a few others at the, as I'm wrapping up here at the end as I was walking around. And I hope that you'll, you'll all start noticing these signs too. Here's Eleanor at 630 Front across from Lucky Pie. Here's the assorted store, the candy store on Front Street. Yoga Junction on Main. And of course, VIX um, in the State Mercantile Building. Uh, here's the Wildwood Guitar Store. I love that so many businesses have big windows where it's like repeating signs. So I was starting to take pictures of reflections of signs and see how many signs I could get into one picture. And uh, it got to be a little too much. And I decided not to include those. But uh, this was really neat to notice that um, it kind of adds to the Main Street experience that we're seeing reflections of signs in windows also. <laughs> and here are a few others. 12 Degree Brewing, very creative sign here. Bittersweet. Um, here's the Steinbaugh Pavilion and Fuzzy Antler. And uh, these bottom two signs were both done by Ed Helmstead. And if you, it's hard because the sign is up so high, but you can see that it says Ed did it on there. And for my final slide, I just want to point out the wonderful opportunity we have coming up in three weeks on September 21st to talk to Ed Helmstead and ask him about his sign painting. And here again is another Ed did it. As I was out walking, here's the master jeweler sign for Eric Olson, um, just right out here on um, Spruce, outside the library, across from the library. And here it says Ed did it. So I hope that you'll um, notice these as you walk around. It's just another aspect of Louisville that I think is really, really fun and interesting. So what questions do you have for me? Yes? How did they make this? How did they get a hold of these? I think a lot of them are photos that were donated to the Boulder Genealogical Society that are now at the Carnegie. And you know, people are able to donate photos where they want to donate them. And I think a number of them may have been donated before we had a museum here in Louisville. So it's nice that a lot of organizations, including our museum, are putting photos online. And there's a lot more uh, accessibility of uh, between organizations. So I can see online. And you can look up and see online what photos the Carnegie has of Louisville. And we also have some photos of Boulder that people have donated to our museum. Sometimes there were families that were in both places. And so whether photos ended up at one place or the other. Um, and then, of course, Denver Public Library has some photos of Louisville, too. So it's really interesting. And I'm always trying to find those photos that I haven't seen before um, to see if they add more information to what we already know about Louisville. Yes? Mm-hmm. No, does anyone else know that? I think that that was, um, would that have been in the 90s or, yeah, the 90s after Steinbaugh's um, moved out of that building and it was remodeled and rehabilitated and I think that's when the sign was made and it may have been to be simple have a simple message, I'm guessing, but I don't really know. And I don't know if anyone else here would know the question being why, um, why it says State Mercantile and not the State Mercantile CO company, um, like it used to look. Yeah, Martin. No. No, other than maybe that it made something sound fancy. <laughs> the, que the question is why the word palace was used a lot in business names. So we, yeah, we saw Sportsman's Palace, and we saw Billy's Palace, um, Crystal Palace. That's right. I never really thought about that. There were at least three, three, sci three business names, at least, with that name. Yeah, I'm going to start paying more attention to the use of the word palace. But does anyone else have a different theory? I think it must have been to just make it sound nice. That would be my guess. Yes? There was one building that you said that had to be taken down because it was excited so 
Yeah. Well, there, there were definitely mining tunnels from the coal mines, and we don't know so much. We're still trying to verify whether there were tunnels between buildings, because there are a lot of stories um, about those, and I, we're always looking for evidence and you know, trying to find proof of that. But we do know that in the 1890s, because of coal mining, there, the ground did drop several inches in in that area around Pine and Maine and even over to Front Street. And um, property owners got settlements from the mine company that caused it. But it was really devastating for the town. There were newspaper articles at the time, and I think it was in the Daily Camera that said, like, Louisville is going under. Like, <laughs> that, you know, this was really alarming. This was a huge, huge problem. You did not want to have your building sinking in your downtown commercial area, and that it was due to coal mining, which is the whole reason why the town existed. So a big brick building like that could not survive, and they had to take it down. But little wooden buildings, which were the majority of the rest of the buildings, they could be propped back up, and actually there were wagon loads of dirt brought in um, to fill fill in the voids and kind of put, prop the buildings back up. And we understand that that's what happened with the building very close to that brick building, the Austin Niehoff House, that's now the Parks and Rec Department. It had that same problem of sinking and they put it back up again. Um, but it, it, that subsidence was due in the 1890s, we know, to coal mining that was happening underneath the ground. Now, uh, well, Louisville has a lot of groundwater. This area has a lot of groundwater, and it's thought that water has filled the voids, and the water even had to be pumped out when the mines were open. So it's been explained to me that that's a reason why we don't see a lot of problems with this anymore. That there's more stability, and it has been so long since the mines closed. So, yes, memory. I do a tour of our So memory in the audience was just talking about the, um, the big brick building that was torn down and how today they would know more when they, and they would be able to build it to withstand um, different events that might happen. Um, so what I've heard is that when that happened, it really scared the town officials about whether to allow more brick buildings. So for a long time, more brick buildings were not built. And the, the older brick buildings that we see predated that time when the big brick building. So for example, the Center for the Arts building that's a brick building, that was built before the state mercantile um, had to come down. So for a long time, I think there was not good technology to know whether it was safe and they were wor understandably worried. And now, of course, they, ha as you say, they have the ability to tell. And for example, we're in a brick building now and um, with an underground parking garage. <laughs> and they, have, they were able to make sure that that would all be safe, yeah. Anything else? Redmond's Hall, what that Redmond's Hall, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but I think that goes back quite a ways. So Redmond's Hall was, very close to where the pool is now at Memory Square Park, and it was torn down in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm not, I'd have to check to see when it was built. Yeah, it was used.
Redmond's Hall was a very important community building, for sure, yeah. Anything else? Anything about businesses, signs, buildings? Was, is, was this an interesting topic? Is, would you like to see more of this kind of thing? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks. Thanks for